Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so glad to, see, glad to be here. Um, so, you know, we already talked about a lot about the deep learning, and then I'm going to talk about one of the key foundations of the deep learning, um, which is basically computing systems hardware, uh, which performs uh, deep learning. Uh, as you know, the deep learning uh, really revolutionized our life, and it demands even higher performance and getting more and more sophisticated. And this requires hardware to be also um, you know, more advanced and high performance. So here, I'm going to introduce uh, some of the key advances in the architectures of the computing hardware uh, that is specially designed for machine learning and AI. All right, here is the outline of my talk. Uh, I'm gonna first talk about the uh, complexity of the deep learning, uh, just to make it a little bit familiar to you. And then we're gonna talk about the, uh, uh, how this deep learning is actually computed in a computing hardware. And apparently this will shed us a light on what's the performance bottleneck of the modern computing system in executing the deep learning algorithms. Then finally, we're going to uh, introduce a few uh, important architecture innovation that we recently made to make it you know, possible, um, to make it faster and more energy efficient to execute the deep learning algorithms. All right, so what is the deep learning? I mean, already the two professors have, have a very good overview. I have a, a little cute picture here that basically uh, show the, what the deep learning is doing. I mean, deep learning is essentially an algorithm solving a variety of the problems, uh, notably classification problem, meaning classifying a picture to either a picture of cat or a picture of dog. The key part of the deep learning is the uh, neural network model, uh, which is shown uh, like this, and then the methodologies to train this neural network model. So how the neural network model look like? Um, this is the one example neural network that recently developed. This is called ResNet 34, meaning it actually has a 34 layers, right? So it has uh, like these squares, and each of them is called layers. And the inputs, such as like a picture, coming from the left side, and it go through these 32 layers and compute, and eventually produce the result for example, whether the picture was the picture of the cat or picture of the dog, right? Um, this network actually contains uh, several different types of layers, uh, but most important two are convolution layers and the fully connected layers. So what is the convolution layer? So I'm going to test you a little bit of the uh, basics of the linear algebra here. Um, so convolution layers perform the convolution. Right, as the name suggests. And uh, it has a basically working with the two different matrix. One is the input matrix, the other is the uh, filter matrix. And um, from the input matrix, what they're gonna do is, oh, sorry. Uh, we're gonna grab a small section of the matrix, in, the, in this case, three by three, because we are kind of matching the same types of matrix here, right? And after that, we're going to do dot product, this matrix with this matrix, right? So if you actually do the dot product, what that means is you're going to be multiply the element in the same position and then accumulate the result, right? So here, I have a 1 and a 1 here. So it's 1 times 1 is the 1. And the next time, I have a 0 minus 1, so it's a 0, right? So you keep doing all of these elements, and then you're going to get the result, which is plus 3, right? So that's the one convolution. And what you're going to do is do the second convolution uh, by sliding the window to the right, right? Now you have another 3 by 3 matrix, and do the same dot product with the same weight, weight matrix, right? All right? So then we're going to get the scalar again. So you do this across the entire image from left, to the top, from left to the right and from top to bottom, and you get the result, which is the matrix. Right? So that's the convolution. 
And then we're going to do poorly, I mean, another, another important layer is a poorly connected layer, and which is again, you know, another forms of uh, a linear algebra. And you are multiply a vector with the weight matrix and produce the vector, right? So uh, there's a few difference though, as compared to the convolution layer. The first difference is input is vector instead of the matrix, which is a small difference, I guess. And more important difference is actually the weight uh, matrix, which used to be three by three in convolution layer, is now become thousand by thousand or 10,000 by 10,000. So it's gonna be a much bigger weight matrix you're gonna see in the fully connected layer. And the third difference is um, it actually has a no repetition through the sliding window operation. In previous convolution case, we are moving the sliding window across the input layers, but this is just one multiplication and that's it, right? So after this convolution, I mean fully connected layer computation, you're gonna get uh, output uh, vector uh, um, as the output of the fully connected layer. All right, then the uh, inference uh, basically perform this type of operation many, many times. And uh, uh, for classifying whether the picture contains the uh, face of the cat or not, actually involves the quite a bit of computation, although it only analyzed only one image. And you know, I give you the representative number, but you know, this could be actually bigger than that. Basically, we're gonna talking about you know, billions of convolutions and quite a bit of a data movement. Um, and training is even more complicated. Uh, it is involves the 50,000 image, and they actually repeat the same things probably 100 to 1,000 times. So that means training is actually imposed the computation complexity that is like 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 7, right? So that's a huge amount of uh, uh, complexity. And that's the problem, the new problem, I guess, to the computing architecture community as well as, well as the algorithm because, uh, you know, that is actually a big problem. All right, so let's uh, switch a gear a little bit and then see how these algorithms actually computed in a modern computing hardware. Right here, uh, I show you the uh, von Neumann architecture, uh, which is basically all the computers that we have, pretty much all the computers we have based on. So von Neumann computing architecture majorly contains the four different components. Uh, one is the uh, ALU, ALU is the arithmetic logic unit, and it is basically hardware that perform the computation, additions, multiplications, and divisions, and so on. And there's a three blue box here. Uh, one is the register, and cache, and main memory, right? And there's a, this uh, red line here. The reason the red line is here is this component, three component, ALU, registers, and cache, are integrated in a single chip. And this chip is basically your CPU and GPU. And there's another chip, which basically for main memory, and this is called DRAM, right? So this red line is actually very important because the, there's a two different physical element, and then in order to moving the data between these two elements, it cost delay time and energy. So it's important to minimize the data movement between this red line. So I talked about these three blocks, and uh, these three blocks are basically have a same characteristic, which is basically they are working as a data storage, meaning they are storing the data and retrieve it if you want to retrieve, right? And these are actually a little bit different in terms of the designs and architectures and even fundamental technologies. However, the one of the most notable uh, differences is the capacity of each memory element. So registers, we are usually talking about kilobyte of the memory. So one byte is the eight bit. So that's the kilobyte, right? So, but cache is actually a megabyte. So modern computer, if you pay maybe $10,000, you probably get the highest perform performance CPU that probably contains hundreds of megabyte. And that's the kind of a, something that we can get it from the market. And the third, the component main memory is the DRAM, which contains about gigabyte of the data storage. All right, so convolution, right? I mean, you know, we talked about convolution operation, and convolution operation is mostly handled by ALU, registers, and to some extent, cache. 
The reason is that if you remember the convolution algorithm, the size of the data is relatively small. It has a three by three matrix and there's an input, right? And the, you, do the, you do the sliding window. So data size is relatively small and this allow you to actually store pretty much the entire data inside of the chip, of this chip, the first chip, CPU and GPU. So you're gonna basically reading the data from registers and compute and you repeat this roughly 11, time, 11 billion times or something like that. So very large number of times. Um, the, com the fully connected layer uh, is a little bit different, uh, mainly because uh, it has a much larger data size to handle. The weight matrix that we show is thousand by thousand. So if element, each element is the 32 bit, that's already like how many? 32 million bits, right? That's a fairly big number. Um, so there's a, this ma uh, large data size that you need to handle, so you have to kind of utilize uh, main memory and grab the data from the main memory, path through the ALU, compute, moving back. So there's a long distance to go. All right, so how are we gonna handle this? So I'm gonna talk about few architectures from now. So here is the reminder of the convolution layers, right? I mean, just in case you forget. Um, so uh, basically, we're gonna multiply this matrix with this guy, right? And basically, we have to multiply element by element and accumulate all the result. So this is actually performed like this. So there's a two different memory storage element, and this element contains the, all the input data the first three by three matrix, and this guy contains the second three by three matrix, right? And what we're gonna do is, we're gonna grab the first data from each element, right? And then put it into the ALU, right? And ALU do the multiplication, and the result coming out, and we save it for the future use, right? And next cycle, we do the same thing for the second data, and we repeat this nine times, and eventually, get the final result. So if you do this, it takes uh, nine cycles of the clock, which is not bad, but you know, this sounds like a wonderful. It doesn't sound like a very wonderful. So uh, what we can do is, uh, potentially, there will be a better way, right? I mean, what if you can just reading out all of this data and just putting into the another element and just produce the result, right? That's great because you can do it in one cycle. Uh, however, this actually doesn't work. The reason is, in your memory circuit, now you have a nine arrows, right? And this is actually all hardware that you have to add. And there's no memory that can read nine data at a single time, because you have a nine times of the overhead. Uh, silicon become too large. So you can really do that. Uh, instead, recently, people try to uh, make a new type of a memory that can actually do something similar, but without actually reading, reading out of the data. So this is called in-memory computing registers, and basically what it does is, there's uh, data coming from the left, which is the input matrix, and then the weight matrix is stored here. And you're gonna basically sending the data, and then the data is fused inside of this hardware, without reading out, and then the result is just coming out of the uh, bottom. And they actually involve a little bit of an analog and mixed signal paradigm of the computation, but you know, let's skip that for now, because it's make it too boring and complicated. Uh, and uh, this kind of hardware actually provides a very, very large improvement over the conventional architectures. For example, we are talking about 500 terabs, uh, tera operation per second per watt. So this unit is the energy efficiency unit. Bigger is good, bigger, bigger number is better. And uh, basically, uh, they showing the how much watt is needed for perform a certain amount of our computation. And uh, the second metric, which is the throughput per given silicon area, tera operation per second per millimeter square, is about five tera per watt, which is actually very high. Because convolutional, uh, conventional digital hardware the number is in the order of 10, tar 10 tops per watt and uh, uh, you know, 0.1 tops per millimeter square. So we are talking about roughly three order magnitude improvement in terms of the speed and energy consumption. 
All right, so let's look at the second problem, which is the fully connected layer. Uh, again, here is the reminder. I have a large matrix, I mean, small vector here, very large matrix, and produced uh, uh, another vector, right? That's the fully connected layer. And uh, the conventional way of doing it is actually uh, first moving the data from DRAM to the ALU. So there's a thousand by thousand matrix stored in the DRAM. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move it all the way to the ALU, right? And maybe I was lucky and I don't really, uh, I already maybe have an a input matrix, an input vector, 1,000 by 1 input vector, stored in register or cache. So maybe they are stored, I mean, moving to only one or two, um, you know, distance, I guess. And then after that, I want to multiply and produce the result, and this result may be sitting, you know, in another register contents or cache. This is great. Um, but if you look at this picture, there's a data moving across this red line, right? Which is thousand by thousand, so that means one million, right? So there's a one million data moving from DRAM to uh, ALU uh, across the uh, chip boundary. There's a two different chips, right? These are separated, maybe a few centimeters. So this takes a lot of time, and energy consumption, and you want to minimize any data move across this, uh, traverse across this red line. So what we can do is, somewhat obvious, um, what we can do is, so data was here, right? Thousand by thousand data. So that will just make it there, make it stay. Don't move, right? Instead, what I'm gonna do is, um, I'll move input data from register to DRAM. So it's now different direction, right? And then what I'm gonna do is I'll add the new hardware inside of the DRAM that can actually perform multiplication in it. So now I have a small multipliers that multiply the thousand by thousand matrix with a thousand by one vector. The result coming out and this result going back to the register, right? In this scenario, uh, the benefit is indeed the amount of the data that move across these red lines is only 2,000. Previously, it was uh, 1 million. So there's about 5x difference between first architecture and the second architecture. So this is called NDRAM computing, and there's uh, lots of people working on these architectures. Um, and because it has a very high potential, uh, to improve the performance of the uh, computing system in today's world. All right, so that's great. So these two are, you know, kind of a nice thing because you can reduce the overhead related to the memories and, you know, everything become faster and so on. But in the end, the deep learning is just simply too complicated. <laughs> it's just so much computation, right? I'm talking about like billions of computation uh, every time you want to analyze one image and multiply that with the 10 to the 6, that's the training complexity, right? So that's a lot. So in the end, we have to rely on the, our old friend, which is the parallelism, right? Okay, this is it, right? Adding more hardware and do it in parallel. So if you have a thousand work and one people working, it takes thousand days. But if you have a thousand people there and if you can actually parallelize the task, then you can do it in a one day, right? So that's the promise of the parallelism, and actually very work well for deep learning because the deep learning workload is actually well parallelizable workload, one of the few actually that is well parallelizable. So that's why in your GPU, actually you have a 4,000 cores in it. So it has actually 4,000 cores that accelerate these uh, multiplications and additions. So that's great. Uh, problem is, there's a law of 80, 20, right? I mean, if you have 100 people, only 20 people actually work, and 80 people doesn't work, right? Don't work. So it's the same for a computer, actually. If a 1,000 cores, it's only like 200 cores work. Uh, like 800 cores doesn't work. I mean, these are not bad cores in by, by any means, but you can actually cannot provide the data promptly to them all the time. And they just waiting until the next data comes in. So even if you have a thousand cores, you have a huge amount of underutilization problems. And because of this underutilization problem, 
you're not going to get the high performance or you know, high energy efficiency. Because um, you know, these cores actually uh, still need uh, some type of the bookkeeping. And this bookkeeping costs energy and also delay. So to address this problem, you know, people are looking at uh, new techniques in designing chips. So these are the chips called Katana that is recently published. And uh, it consists of the 16 microprocessors and interconnected with the uh, uh, network on chip. Um, so, you know, these are kind of a trend. Although we designed this, you know, we are not the only one who designed this kind of a stuff. Um, so these multi-core processors apparently can give you the very high computing throughput, and you can actually trade up the throughput for high energy efficiency as well. Um, however, as I told you, um, the underutilized core, there's a 16 core, but you can't guarantee all these 16 cores actually working. And they, none of, uh, the, work, the core that doesn't work actually consume energy uh, because they want to have a bookkeeping. So what we actually did here is to come up with the techniques that can actually uh, make this core to sleep when it's not used. So it's obvious, right? But the innovation here is previously the sleeping period has to be long for the machine. It needs to be millisecond. Millisecond sleep, right? I mean, it's a, it's a machine word. So one millisecond machine is like infinite in some sense. Uh, but you know, millisecond sleep uh, is not good because uh, then you're gonna losing all the energy if the idle period is less than millisecond. So what you know we can do is potentially we can actually make it to sleep only for one cycle and wake up in the next cycle. And by doing this extreme, you know, fine grain power management you can actually save you know, big deal of the energy consumption of the processors. All right, so uh, this is my last kind of set of the slide. Uh, basically, I'm gonna talk about more exotic stuff, which is analog computing. So this is the 1960s, uh, and actually there was a computer wholly made out of the analog circuits. I guess some of you actually remember these days, right? They actually used this machine to um, make a, a rocket and fly to the moon, right? So this is not toy, this is the real machine, and they're solving very complicated differential equation out of this machine. So this is uh, amazing. Uh, and however, this technology is completely forgotten for the last 50 years. The reason is apparently, digital computers are so good and nobody care about analog computer anymore, right? It's just the uh, museum stuff, pretty much. All right, so uh, interestingly, in 2016, uh, we actually fabricated two chips that actually miniaturized the analog computer into a single chip. So this is the 2016's analog computers that actually solving the differential equation. And uh, this works great. Actually, works like 100 times better than the modern digital computer. So amazing. Why, why would you do that? I mean, it's an analog computer, right? I mean, it's cheap, it's expensive to fabricate it. You know, it's not for free. And why would you do that? Um, the reason is digital computer was great, but it wasn't improved any much, that much. I mean, not as fast as before. It's kind of slowed down pretty much, right? So. So this is one of the alternative, and people are looking at it, alternative, because they want to have a more computing power in everywhere. So uh, let me briefly introduce uh, what's the advantages of, and the uh, disadvantages of the analog computers. So analog computer is only good if the target precision is low. How low? 8 bit, 8 bit, 9 bit, that's kind of range. So if you're talking about 16 bit, 32-bit, you know, you should forget about analog computer because it doesn't give you the necessary precision for that kind of high computation. However, 8-bit is actually very good for a lot of uh, physical world. Sensors, I mean, these are not producing 16-bit output. Most of the sensors just produce 8-bit, 9-bit, you know, that kind of stuff. So precision is low. Uh, then, this actually provides a very small hardware, low power, you know, no thermally aggressive, and everything is good. 
Uh, but there are sorts of disadvantages. One is that there's no good memory, meaning usually capacitor is used, and the analog computer doesn't have a good memory. So this requires the you know limit the architecture decision, and also the computation result are repro not not very much reproducible. Sometimes it give you the point A port, sometimes it give you the point A two port, and so on and so forth. So indeed, the engineering, you know, simple way to fix the problem is combining the things and then eventually, you know, hybridization of the analog and digital computers can be a way to break through. So this is the one example that, um, you know, this hybridization. So this is the uh, artificial cochlear chip that actually detect, you know, and recognize the human speech. And uh, uh, what we did is basically there's a front end which completely made of the analog circuit, and this is basically do the convolutions for the speech. And there's a fully connected layer on the bar, I mean the, on, on, the, on the right end, which is completely digital, and that's gonna do the um, um, uh, classification. And hybridization of these two technologies actually give you the very good high uh, energy efficiency, which is one microwatt, which still remains the one of the uh, most power efficient system in this type of uh, uh, application. All right, so this is the, uh, my last slide. Um, so I think if you were born before 1980, you probably remember this TV show. Uh, this is the uh, Knight Rider, and this is about the uh, car that can talk to you and self-driving, right? So here, I'm gonna make uh, two important or you know, some aggressive uh, prediction. The first prediction is this hairstyle will be popular again. <laughs> Fashion is uh, returning itself, right? So the second prediction I'm I going to make is we're going to see this car very soon. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>